please join me in welcoming the crew. <laughs> Andy, I see you have your hand up. I don't know if there's a question um, with getting technology going maybe, or I think we may have lost him again. I don't know. Um, but maybe we could start off with Michael Stanley. Maybe do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself or I'm happy to read your bio as well. My bio um, is a little boring, but I'll just <laughs> tell you what I do. <laughs> That's even better. So, uh, <laughs> okay, so Carol, since undergraduate college, I've been in the same industry, the same vertical. Um, I'm a lender. Uh, I run a finance company that, that basically specializes in consumer products uh, with a particular focus on fashion, which includes footwear, jewelry, apparel, home goods, furniture, floor coverings, and the like. Um, and we, my company has been around for a long time, since 1938, we remain a private company. And we have offices in New York, Los Angeles, and, and Atlanta. And that's what we do. We lend money predominantly to um, a lot of people that you would otherwise, household names, past and present clients. And that's what I do. Great, thank you. Um, David, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, thank you. Uh, good, to, uh, good to see everybody and, and thank you for having me. Um, my name is David Botano. I'm Vice President uh, at Genu Pactor. We are a, a boutique executive search firm with a global presence. So uh, we support mostly the, the fashion, uh, beauty, and retail industry. Uh, we also do some general uh, consumer work. Um, our focus is, is across many functions within the industry from um, you know, general C-level -le -level leadership to uh, retail, wholesale, manufacturing, marketing, uh, digital e-commerce has been uh, uh, super focused lately, um, as is logistics and supply chain and some of those roles. So we were across the industry and, and happy to speak with you guys about uh, whatever is of interest to you. Um, my career started um, within luxury fashion, within retail. Retail. Uh, I fell into recruiting about 12, 13 years ago, uh, starting at all levels, um, and now you know, mostly geared towards the executive, but, but have a close touch on, uh, uh, on the industry in general. So I uh, look forward to being here. What did you do when you were in the industry, David? I was in retail. So uh, I started out um, yeah, many, many years ago. Started first job was with Louis Vuitton in, in London on Bond Street in their store uh, when I was just a teenager. And then from there, spent some time with Banana Republic, as most people in the industry do. And then I was um, off with Brooks Brothers for about three years, growing within management, uh, often even Marcus as well, before landing on the, on the search side of the business. That's great. Ah, Andy, nice to see you. I'm sorry, I'm late. We had a technical glitch. How are you? That's okay. It happens to me all the time. <laughs> Happy to have you here. Um, if you continue to have trouble, I, I often tell people if you shut down your computer and restart it, I don't know if you've already tried that, it seems to be the trick for Blackboard Collaborate. For whatever reason, it makes it work a lot better. Your connection is always a lot better after. But <laughs> all right. So I think we're okay. I think we're okay. You can hear us, we can hear you, perfect. Well, um, everyone was just going through and, and talking a little bit about their uh, path and what they do. Uh, we skipped over you, but if you wanna go now, that would be great. Sure, I began my career as an accident. Uh, I was going to graduate school in the evening, I needed a daytime job, and I took the, a, a job in, it was a long time ago, in 1972, in the fashion industry and operations and watched a lot of people in design and merchandising and sales make a lot of money. And I said, well, that's when the fashion industry was called the Garment Center. And I said, I don't like that name. I had an objective to change it into the fashion industry. And I grew, I learned a lot about design, production and merchandising. And I became a sales manager of a company and eventually I became the head of division of Ralph Lauren, who was the first license that Ralph Lauren had. And we wound up building it into quite a large business. And along the way, I learned a lot about licensing and M&A. And then I became the president of a company called Jones Apparel Group, which had about 25 divisions. 
and we were one of the largest apparel companies through the 70s and 80s. And then about 1982, I was recruited by a company in American France that owned part of Yves Saint Laurent, owned Ralph Lauren Women's Wear, owned Calvin Klein Men's Wear, both as licenses and distribution companies. And because I spoke French, I became the president of the company. And we acquired the first Karl Lagerfeld business when he was designing a brand on his own. And then, because I've got a lot of gray hair and been doing this a long time, um, about 29 years ago, I had reached most of my objectives and I thought I should give something back. And I started a consulting group uh, aimed at mergers, acquisitions, licensing, and pure advisory work. And our clients have been very big companies like Ralph Lauren and Calvin Klein and very small companies like Carly Cushney and companies that are just about being born. And our clients go from apparel to footwear to jewelry to home furnishings. Neat, thank you. Wealth of experience to share. Um, Karen, do you wanna explain your background a little bit? And I love that piece of art behind you. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, I started out in retail very traditionally. I worked at Macy's. I was in their executive training program many years ago and worked in the stores and the buying line. And um, I was really intrigued by TV shopping because when I had gone to undergrad school, I was in broadcasting and theater arts. So I thought it was a nice way to marry the you know retail experience that I had with the education. And I went on and worked at QVC for 14 years. Um, some of that time in the buying line, some of that time in the marketing world. And then uh, when I left, I had the opportunity to run the Accessories Council, which is a not-for-profit trade association that was founded by the industry for the industry to help the industry sell more product. So we're really about marketing, consumer awareness, PR, education, anything, any tools that we can provide our members of the industry to help them grow is is what we do. That's great. What year was that founded? Have you been with it the whole time or has it been around a long time? The council was founded in the mid 1990s and I have been a part of it since it was founded. Um, I'm not a founder. There were three people that founded it in the industry and I read a little teeny weeny article in Women's Wear Daily that it was starting out. And at that time, when I was working at QVC, nobody wanted to sell to QVC. It was not, it was really hard in the early days. And I thought, here might be an opportunity for me to meet people um, and get out from behind my desk. And it's much harder to say no to someone once you know them than, you know, voice on the phone. Um, so I really did it to network and ended up, um, you know, being in and around the council ever since. Oh, that's great. Awesome. Karen, can I go, can I go, can I go, Carolyn, can I go backwards a little bit because I missed the beginning. I just want to add a couple of things. Um, first of all, thank you and everyone at FIT for allowing us to do Thank you for coming. This is great. <laughs> I think we're having we're having trouble hearing you. Ugh, and I think we've lost him. Let me just give a second. Maybe he'll be right back. Annie, are you back? No. Still says he's joining. Well, um, Michael, maybe do you have anything to add about uh, about FSN and the the work that you guys do together? I know I, I gave your bio, but um. yeah, yeah. So it's an interesting group. It's a group that has um, members from all 
uh, various and assorted uh, industry groups, whether it's um, in, you know, it's trade associations, logistics, uh, various type of lawyers, um, tr trade lawyers, uh, commercial lawyers, various lenders um, that, that cover the whole spectrum of banking, asset-based lending, factoring, um, also ERP systems. So really it's, it's this, this group that we've known each other by and large for a long time and we share information um, and which is a lot of it's extremely relevant today. Um, how do we get through COVID? What does the retail landscape look like? Um, what trade barriers are there? What logistics challenges are there, particularly now, um, that, you know, shipping rates and, um, have, have escalated and there's, there's not a sufficient amount of container ships available. So all these things and, you know, what retailers are, are financially challenged and may not be sustainable. So it's a great group. We share information. Um, you know, when the environment was different, we used to get together and had cocktail parties and, and the like. Um, and hopefully in another couple of months, we can resume all that. Um, and it's a great, it's a, we have a lot of fun We share information. Um, sometimes somebody will tell a joke. It's, it's great. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I don't know if I'm back. Am I back? You're back. You're back. Oh, yeah. Sorry about this. But what I, what I wanted to do is we want to connect the dots of what a brand is about and, and how it's relevant for your students to become a brand and what it's about. And I, I think the first thing is what a definition of a brand is. And we like to use a simple definition. It's like the collective impact of the impression you create from what's experienced and what you say and about the people. And in creating a brand, you have to manage those expectations and live up to them. Um, you know, we all see a lot of brands, Supreme and Nike and LVMH, the Mets and Yeezy, Ralph Lauren. We also see people like Stella McCartney, Rihanna, and of course, Karen Giberson, Mike Stanley, David Watano, and you. And like you've just heard, we all became a brand doing something. And what's most important is how these young people can go out and establish their connections. And it's a good time for them to do it. Things are changing. Definitely. Thank you. That's great. So, you know, the question is, you know, what you what should young people be careful about in thinking about creating their brand? David? Oh, sorry, I didn't, uh, <laughs> didn't hear you call, call me. But yes, I think um, especially within the, uh, within the job market and as you uh, uh, start, your, uh, start your career, it's important to think about how you will be viewed from the industry and what about your experience, your education, uh, your network, your reach, um, how does that speak to the value you provide when you're, when you're in a role? So, um, beginning with the first, first job you're going to take and, and you're going to, you're going to, um, explore as you enter the market to, as you, uh, uh, consider career changes and, and, and job changes. And, um, you know, one of the things I think is important is to, to have a goal of where do you want to be in your career? What do you hope to accomplish? Um, what type of professional, uh, do you want to be in five, 10 years? And, um, it's important to have that target, not not because you're going to ultimately get there, but it helps you in evaluating each decision that you make within your career. And what are you trying to establish? How are you trying to establish your brand so you can achieve that goal? Um, uh, many times that goal will change. Many times where you want to go will change. But as long as you're you're on that path, you're going to help create a story um, and a. Uh, um, you know, again, a brand and, and, and something that would be provide value to the businesses you're going to be joining or that you're going to be creating yourself. Um, so certainly a brand can be everything from the jobs that you are, how long you've been.
been in a job, what your education was like, what your network is, and even more so these days, what is your your um, digital presence? And and in the social uh, media world that we have, how are you? How does your LinkedIn play into that? How does your Instagram play into that? Twitter, Facebook, all these things will establish yourself and. Um, uh, each employer uh, that you consider will 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 Google you and will look into all these different uh, social media presences that you have. So important for you to start creating that, building that uh, again to hopefully accomplish that ultimate goal, even if it's going to change uh, from time to time. Karen, you you see a lot of different things happening in the industry and change in technology innovation. Could you talk about that a little bit about? why young people and students coming out of FIT have a leg up on other people? All right, here I am again. We're in trouble. Oh, there we go. Now I'm connected. No, we hear you, Andy. Don't worry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, we, we're seeing a real shift on how people are shopping. And, you know, it's interesting as I look back on the last year, some of our members that did the best were our entrepreneurial young and medium-sized companies because they didn't have a lot of infrastructure and big teams so they were able to be nimble and really work their businesses to become more direct to consumer and in fact because it, you know there's stores were shrinking the opportunities to get in stores were harder they already had to be savvy in how to use technology to help grow their businesses. And so it's been a lot of fun to watch the success of some of these companies that are just, you know, turning this, turning this opportunity into um, something very exciting. And I, you know, I could use example after example, people like Emily Bodie, who came through our, one of our mentoring programs, um, uh, there's a, a knitwear woman that we worked with, her name is Ray, and she just ended up in the New York Times this weekend um, and on the cover of Rolling Stone uh, with her outfit. So there's opportunities out there, it's just, you know, attacking it, yeah. My question is, when you do investigation on people looking for jobs, I'm sorry. Was that directed okay. at me? Yeah, Mike, Mike, Mike Stanley. Okay, so so Andy in the group, you know, we see this there's three hurdles to, to brands and branding. There's got to be differentiation, right? There has to be relevance. I mean, wh what is the narrative? I mean, for ex as an example, um, you look at Tesla. Tesla spends like no money on advertising, but yet the founder uh, gets on Saturday Night Live. I mean, God, God bless him. Brands have to be sustainable, whether it's environmentally sustainable, socially sustainable, or economically sustainable. So when people invest in a brand, um, they, re they really have to consider these, these three hurdles, um, you know, particularly, you know, as it relates to either an individual or a corporate brand. We lost Andy again. Oh, well. Yeah. <sighs> um, but then, you know, the interesting thing is because of COVID, you know, we saw it's like huge structural shifts. Um, the shift that had been taking place, you know, with brick and mortar stores and, and the contraction of retail. And, you know, what that what we saw from our perspective was that accelerated and um, and then so many stores either uh, closed, uh, fell for bankruptcy, reorganized with less, you know, less of a platform. Um, and, you know, what we see going forward as far as, you know, just the number of, of retail uh, footage will, con will contract. Um, we had probably pre-COVID around um, uh, in the high teens as far as square footage per, per capita in the U.S. 
and we see probably a shift toward, you know, under 10 feet per capita, which will probably, you know, resemble the European model as far as um, square footage. But it takes time. But what, what happened was COVID accelerated all that. Um, and then now, you know, certainly we're coming back to, um, you know, more of a normalcy. And, you know, what, 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 why would you go into a store? You would go into a store today for the service and or for the experience. Um, and I think the stores have a challenge now as far as millennials. I mean, a lot of them are concerned that millennials won't go beyond the, the you know, the ground floor. Um, and I think that's the challenge we're seeing with, with traditional brick and mortar uh, retail. Mm -hmm. Caroline, we, we see you in front of the classroom and we know your achievements. Could you tell your, your students about your career, how you got there? Yeah, well, I'm, I, uh, I started out in a training program with linens and things uh, and went through uh, a three month program where I learned everything about all the different facets that kind of make up a large company. Um, linens and things, unfortunately, is no longer, but I also myself, you know, talking about my brand and where I wanted to be, I wanted to be in apparel. So I made the leap over to Ann Taylor, was there for a number of years. Uh, actually, that's not true. I was there for about a year before I was recruited by a friend over to Ralph Lauren. Um, and then I spent um, close to a decade there. Uh, you know, I think we're talking a lot about your brand and your own personal brand and how that it's something that you carry with you. I mean, it's an intangible thing that exists or that circulates around um, clothing or, or accessories or what have you, but it also is something that exists from you and it is as strong as your connections and the people that you meet. And every job that I've gotten, other than that one job out of school, which my school helped me to get, I will be honest with, um, every other one since then has been because of a personal relationship that I built along the way. And someone who has, you know, stuck their neck out for me or tossed a little FYI my way or, um, you know, a recruiter that I've met along the way who, you know, thought of me when a job opportunity came along. And, um, you know, that all has to do with the brand that I think I, I built for myself early on. Um, I, when I left Ralph Lauren, I, I made the jump over to G3 Apparel, um, was over there running the Kenzie and GH Fast lines um, for sales and um, the New York office. And then I went to a children's wear company for, um, for a bit as I was becoming a mother myself and my interests were changing from women's apparel to kids apparel and um, spent some time there launching some launching brands. I launched a couple of brands at that company as well as um, at GH Bass at Wholesale for, um, for G3 and uh, Polo for Ralph Lauren. So launching a brand is really fun to kind of get off the ground and you don't know which direction the brand's gonna go, but um, you learn a lot in those first few months. But you have to manage the brand all through the process and that's what's important and manage expectations. But what's important for you students to know, all of us know, we start off on one route and we wind up on a lot of different routes, but we collect experience. And that's really, really important. You know, one of the things that we, we see today is knowledge and experience is vital and innovation becomes the key. You take the next idea, you tweak it a little bit, but the important words are networking. You know, we all have a network of friends that help us do things, get jobs, make us smarter. But I think, your students and all students have an advantage over all of us, especially me with a lot of gray hair, is the ability to navigate through the digital space, to understand how it connects, how communications become instantaneous. You know, it, it's not that long ago when I was in the apparel business, when there was an expression about the limited, when the limited was really important. And they would say a trend starts in Milan on Monday and it arrives in Columbus about four months later. Um, not really the case today. It happens instantaneously. People know everything at the same time. Yeah. It's, uh, and in a, in a good way and a bad way, I think. 
<laughs> I would, uh, Carolyn, I would just follow up on something you mentioned and, and Andy too, and, and that's the, the network that you developed over the years and how vital they can be in uh, pushing forward your career. Um, I th you know, and what we do, of course, we're helping uh, people find jobs and we're helping companies identify talent. Um, but that's pretty narrow, and I think most uh, placements still happen through connections that people have and, and through people you know. So um, there's, you know, it's, it's vitally important that you start building your network within the space that you want to be um, and creating a voice uh, out there in that space, too, and, and letting as many people as possible know what you're about, what your brand is going to be or what you're looking to build and who you're looking to be so that they can act as an advocate for you. Uh, as you develop your career and, and sure there'll be job postings out there and there'll be recruiters out there that'll come find you. Um, but the more control you have over where you go in your career, the better off you'll be and, and the, the quicker you'll be able to get the job that you want besides relying uh, on what the world out there offers to you. So build that brand, build that network um, and create opportunities for yourself. Karen, you want to tell everyone how we network at, F at Fashion Service Network? how we connect ideas and people, and that's really been pretty cool. Yeah, I, I look at our industry like a puzzle, and all the information you need to put good decisions and make, um, you know, make good choices for your brand, or in my case, your organization, requires um, intelligence from, from from many places. So I may look at trend information to know what's going to be hot. I might look at statistics from a company like MPD to know what's already selling. But the information that the operations side of the business gives you is the other piece of the puzzle that you need. Like, are stores solvent? Are they paying their bills? Is this a good place to sell? Um, is, this is this a credit worthy uh, brand? Or in the case uh, of a recent discussion we had, had to do with shipping and some of the real challenges that our companies are facing is getting goods on time and you know increased ex expenses. So how can we take some of this information, share it with our members so they can um, be prepared or make decisions that will save them money down the line? So I think it's really important important to have a network not just of obvious peers but uh, if you look at like a target you know all those connected businesses around you that can impact your your world dramatically so I, I very much have appreciated my um, my time with the fashion service network because um, you just never know what little gem is going to come up that will really make a difference in helping someone Yeah, I think it's been hugely impactful for, for me and, and I've been with the with the group for the last few years, but especially going through COVID and the amount of information from all different areas of the business that we've been able to uh, to gain it and that you know our, our members have shared have helped me in advising my clients in, in the world where they weren't necessarily hiring, but being able to speak to them about you know what are the challenges that other companies are facing and, and how are companies approaching um, you know, work from home policies these days and, and are you going back? And I think Karen, you just sent out a, an amazingly uh, insightful uh, survey uh, that you did with your with, with your group um, that I've you know found a lot of value and been advising my clients to. So the uh, ability to share information and then extend uh, the networks of our members to our clients uh, has been really important. And I've shared you know people with Michael and, and, and Andy too, and and coming back to me also. So I think finding a, a networking group or or events and and places for you to, to to socialize, whether it be virtually like we're doing these days or in person, uh, has been really important to me throughout my career, and especially with the uh, FSM these last few years. It, and, and we've been very lucky over the years to have a relationship at FIT, both with you, the students, and many of the professors and instructors, and allowing us to learn about important concepts like sustainability and renewable resources and techno fibers and new techniques in communication. You know, um, the one thing that remains to be important in, in your education is to know that fashion's about change. Our fashion industry is changing all the time. And information is so important to be able to use, especially when you're going to look for new opportunities. 
And as you said on your course of looking for jobs, I don't know how many of you already have jobs or are looking for jobs, you're better informed about new technology than most people in industry and how it integrates. And it's important for you to be able to use those tools to be able to talk about that. You know, it, it's, it's an odd thing. I, I, I teach a course, uh, an MBA course online with a friend of mine at Columbia. And I explained to some people about a month ago, 15 years ago, most people never knew how to go online and gathering data was a trial. You know, a lot of people still didn't really know how to use the computer as obviously by me this morning or this afternoon. But it's really the fast technology connection to industries, which will allow all of you to exceed in your career. You have to pay attention to a lot of things to get there. That's great. I Mike, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Annie. That's great. Mike, Mike, which industries are you seeing a lot of activity in in the last couple of years that you your company finances? Um, we had purchased a company, it's been now two years ago, that was sent, was um, located in Atlanta, was part of a bank, and they focused predominantly on financing home goods, furniture, uh, floor coverings, and the like. And what we experienced, particularly through COVID, that their business just didn't continue to, to, to exist, it flourished. Because, you know, as, as a lot of us know, you know, we were home, we said, you know, that couch has got to go, or you know, or or the, the floor covering, or um, you know, all the things that we have within the confines of our home, and that business really accelerated. The other businesses that we saw that did extraordinarily well over the last year was high-end jewelry, high-end jewelry. Um, footwear was a, a laggard. Um, ex accessories also was not as strong. Um, I would say uh, apparel did pick up, particularly over the last couple of months, but the, the shining star in our portfolio was the home goods section. It, was, it, it, really, it really accelerated beyond the beyond. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. Yep. And of course, you know, it, it changed buying patterns you know, certainly um, how consumers purchase. Obviously, we were relegated to the, you know, to our, our homes and um, and online sales, you know, certainly accelerated, but, you know, exponentially. Um, and, um, and a lot of these direct-to-consumer brands emerged and continued to flourish through this, this event. Yep. Yeah, Andy, I would echo all of that. So certainly we saw a lot of movement at home. Uh, digital e-commerce uh, roles were, were, were super important and those businesses that were uh, digitally native or, or had an established direct consumer presence um, were strong and those that were lagging behind were hiring people to get them up and running in that space as quickly as possible. Uh, health and wellness is, is uh, an area that we saw perform really well uh, also, uh, whether it be companies like a Peloton or Mirror, uh, uh, Tonal, those sort of companies that offer at home uh, exercise or uh, the equipment or apparel that you need to wear as you're exercising or lounging on your couch. So Lululemon, I think has been a top performer, um, but you look at uh, that, any athletic brand, but you know, from the men's side, uh, we work with a company called Roan, uh, another one called Viore, and those both, you know, have had, had banner years as well. So I think that space along with home uh, was what we saw the, the most business come from. Karen, how do, how do you market your services so people know what you do so they can understand what the business is about? How do you talk to people outside of your close-in network to promote? We have uh, developed a pretty robust email list, and we reach out to our members every week, every Monday, with uh, a newsletter that has opportunities 
Um, most of them are at no cost and, um, you know, news updates on our members, uh, you know, things that they can participate in. Every Monday we send that out. And then quarterly we started a digital magazine we were able to acquire during the, um, you know, the last year and relaunch so we can tell uh, stories about our brands and companies. and. Uh, by default, about ourselves and, and what we do. We're finding that the mix of outreach um, editorially is a nice balance to the outreach that we make for events in getting, um, you know, really meeting new people. We can't wait to go back to in-person trade shows and places where we're on the ground because that was traditionally how we um, how we communicated, but I'll tell you, we have discovered through the last year that we have a global group of members. Um, when we do our educational events online, we have many, many more people attend than we ever have had doing them in person. I don't think we'll ever go back, um, and it's an odd We've learned a lot more about geographically where where they're all at, so we can, um, you know, we can kind of focus in on, on, uh, you know, needs based on sometimes, you know, not just uh, what they're doing, but where they're doing it. You know, there's there's a common thread that goes from everything that Karen does and David does, Michael does, and Carolyn does, and that's being staying relevant. You know, being aware of what's going on around us talking to people in our networks and new people, sort of collecting people all the time. But at the end of the day, it's about communication. You know, when you want to look for a job or you want to look for the next job, it's being aware of the products out there and the competition and who does something well and who does something not so well. But being a master of communication in some form has allowed all the members of our group the ones that you're meeting here today, but also the lawyers and the accountants and the real estate people of FSN to be able to present the forum of new ideas all the time. And I'm sure it allows you, Michael, to make decisions on how to loan money to companies. Information, correct? It does. I mean, you know, we, um, we've, we've seen events, um, you know, like the last year happened before, it's certainly not the same in, you know, specifically in my lifetime. Um, I wasn't around for the Spanish flu, Andy. I don't know anybody. I was, I, I was there. Uh, okay. Um, and, uh, but it was interesting because we, we saw the pandemic um, create three separate verticals, you know, as, as far as acceptance, we had to accept it because there was nothing they could do. We had, we had to be appreciative because, listen, none of us on this call died. It was all good. And then we had to adapt. There had to be a adaptation. We had to learn how to work, all work remotely. Um, even though, you know, as human beings, we're, we're, we're tribal and we want to be around other human beings and we were precluded in doing that. Um, so we had to learn how to handle all this and navigate through this. But yeah, it was an experience and you learn through experience. And particularly, how do we learn as, as humans? We learn through trauma. And yeah, this is, this is very traumatic for all of us. Um, so we learned how to like survive and, and learned how to do better, hopefully. Um, but I think that we, the biggest thing that, that I felt neglected as far as you couldn't be around other human beings and, you know, and hug other, other individuals. And, but I think we're going to ultimately and hopefully get there uh, soon, very soon. I can't wait to get a hug. Has anyone seen that um, commercial that's going around by Extra Gun? It's a great commercial. <laughs> um, uh, students, I don't know if you have, maybe I'll email it out to you, but it's it's great commercial with everyone kind of coming out of hibernation and, well, coming together. <laughs> Carolyn, how many of your students already have jobs or are looking for jobs? Do you know? Do you guys want to do uh, tell us by a show of hands if you have a job already for after graduation? Um, looks like about five out of twenty-nine students. And have the others put together resumes or 
personal statements to look for a job? Uh, you guys want a show of hands on that? Is your resume ready? Nope. <laughs> Wait, but you just said you had a job. Left, no? I have one. Well, I have it's, okay. it's not like a paying job. That's my goal for the summer is I want to find a job within the industry while also simultaneously doing, working on my internship. But I will need to get on that resume. Looks like about 11 out of 29 raised their hands as uh, having those resumes ready to go. And how many have gone on interviews at, at any time? Yeah, like nine. Nine of you. So there's a bunch of you out there that have never gone on any interview. That's a great question. <laughs> so you know, it's a little it's it's a little frightening or scary to go on a job interview because you think the other side of the interview is the antagonist. If they're interviewing you, they want to hire somebody. And what they want to hire you. <laughs> Ideally, what all of us. Yeah, what, what all of us have found, though, it's really important for whoever's being interviewed to really know a lot about the company that they're trying to get a job at. And I think David can tell you a lot about that, because when somebody comes in and they don't ask the interviewer questions, not so good. Yeah, very, very true. I think uh, preparation um, uh, for an interview is probably the most important thing you can do uh, to ensure success or at least putting your best foot forward. Uh, something that we focus on heavily is, is having a call with their candidates before they go for an interview and, and trying to help them understand who you're going to be meeting with, what sort of what their background is, what sort of questions they're probably going to be asking, um, what about your background would be interesting to them, what about your background would be valuable to them. Um, you need to understand the brand or the company that you're going for, uh, understand and try to know some of the latest news that have been out there in the press or maybe historically would have been the biggest um, successes and challenges the company has gone through, uh, understanding about the founder. These are all, all as much uh, information as you can have walking into the interview that is is readily available to you. Where, and, and what I mean by that is um, where you're not going to get stumped when someone asks you the question. So kind of going through in your head or in front of a mirror before you go in um, and practicing um, you know, your answers to, to some of those questions. What about the company that the interviewer will probably ask why you want to be at that company? What about the company speaks to you? Um, and so I think having a few points, um, whether it be you know the ethos of the brand or the company, the history of it, something they're doing currently that speaks to you, and some kind of personal connection to, uh, to that company uh, that will show that it's going to be more than just a job for you and something that um, you're going to care deeply about and uh, what employers have found is, is when times gets tough if there is a personal connection to the brand um, you tend to go that extra mile for them versus you know backing out and running for the hills um, so uh, know about the company know about the interviewer and, and now there's so much information out there you know in the digital world uh, and start LinkedIn you know review their LinkedIn they'll have a lot of information on there maybe it's another you know fellow uh, FIT alum that you're speaking to and so you know that's something you can grab onto and, and that'll go a long way uh, maybe there's some other brands or companies that they've been at that speak to you. Um, sometimes they'll have some articles that they have posted that'll be on their LinkedIn page. Look for all this information so the, the interviewer feels like you did your research and that you really care again about this uh, uh, about this uh, uh, opportunity. Um, so yeah, definitely interview prep is, is super important. And I would take, you know, just speaking as in regards to resume, um, super important. And, and even if you haven't had a, a uh, or a number of, of jobs or any jobs, there's still some good information you can put out there. Just the courses that you've taken while you're at FIT, any internships that you've been at, any traveling, any studies you've done, um, you know, any any projects you did through school that you think would be relevant to the industry. Uh, and remember to put all that information that you put into your resume onto your LinkedIn profile as well. And when, uh, uh, again, you know, uh, employers will, when they're before the interview, will go up and look at your LinkedIn. Um, but also as, as recruiters or, or in-house and people who are hiring managers are looking for people, they'll do, uh, you know, keyword searches within LinkedIn to try to find talent. And so if you have all that information about your background on there, you'll have a better chance of being noticed uh, in that world too. But I think Mike, you can talk a little bit about people being careful on what they have on social media, things that you've seen in the past. 
Yeah, we've seen it all. I just think you have to be very mindful how, you know, how, you know, your brand is, um, is, is, is really uh, amplified. Um, and then also, you know, uh, if there's anything that you, you, you really want to clean up when you go out into the job market. But I think the important thing is, is that, you know, you want to show, and, you know, particularly during the interview pro- process, yeah, you have to be candid. Um, you have to tell the truth on, on an application. Um, you know, one of the key things is, is that if you get an offer, it's always subject to um, the employer doing a background search and making sure all the questions you've you know gone through when the application matches up. Uh, I, I think you have to be be careful, but. I think, you know, the, the big questions I, I always advise people when they go on an interview and they get past the HR department um, is that, you know, to the decision maker, the question is, what challenges does the company have over the next, you know, year? Um, what are some of your successes? successes? What are some of your failures? And, you know, what would you consider the three best characteristics of a potential employee? Um, and I think that that's always very helpful. And also, you know, having, you know, looking individuals in the face, having a good posture, you know, things of that, you know, having good manners. And that, that gets you, that gets you in. And Michael, just to follow up on that, now a lot of these interviews are going to be done virtually too. So we probably, you know, 90% of first round interviews right now are done via Zoom um, or Microsoft Teams or, or something like that. So uh, remember to approach that interview just like you would an in-person interview. Um, you know, eye-to-eye contact, you know, having a presence, posture, uh, not looking away, keeping focused on them, not having anything distracting behind you that'll will, will have the uh, interviewer, you know, not looking at, at you. And similarly, making sure to stay focused on that. It's okay to take notes, and, and I think it's important to take notes during an interview, um, but don't be looking away too often. You know, try to keep that engagement um, and, uh, uh, you know, you can, one thing that could be helpful is having your resume uh, right next to where, wherever the, the interview's picture is going to be so you can follow along with them as you're going through your, your background. Um, but the most part, again, you know, having a presence, posture, uh, you know, keeping engaged and, and keeping that uh, contact. Karen, you've hired a lot of interns over the years. Um, what, what do you think interns should be looking for when they're coming to a company like yours or any fashion company? Well, I've, we've actually hired a few of our interns over the years or helped them get jobs. And I think that right now um, it's harder than ever before to be an intern. We do have two um, because you don't necessarily get the exposure and the experience that you would if you were sitting in our office. Um, you know, we tend to do scheduled calls and then, you know, scurry off to do our tasks. But I think the most successful interns that we have had have come in hungry to learn. They're curious. They ask a lot of questions. They volunteer to do projects. Um, They don't just do it. Some, you know, could be asking the why behind uh, they're doing it to understand the impact that that it has. And, um, you know, it doesn't matter if company you're on a you're a part of a team. If you're coming in as an intern, you are part of the team, and they depend on you. So making sure that you deliver and you treat it uh, with the same respect as you would treat a, a, a any job. Um, I don't know. I think most companies pay interns now. We certainly do, um, but. You know, if someone works hard for me, we'll work really hard for that person to help them throughout their career. You know, some of the things that we always see when we look at young people starting jobs is them being attentive to what they do, being passionate for that job, being willing to do more than their job title, and more importantly, be prepared to get the next job. You know know what the person above you is doing so when that person leaves you can be in a place to take that job or at least apply for that job 
So, you know, the fashion system is about cross training. You know, a, a lot of people, including myself, started in sales or started in systems, and they wind up in merchandising by being observant, paying attention to everyone around you. You know, a good banker is a good merchant. A good trade show organizer and a person in charge of a trade group has to be a great merchant. Being in the public relations business and executive recruiting business, you have to be a merchant to look at talents. I, I'm in the M&A and licensing business. Merchandising is a key. And as you heard from Caroline, she's a merchant. She's taken her skills, which will tell us about how she developed them and transferred from being a retailer to really being a wholesale distributor and, and brand builder. You know. Yeah, I think I think very uh, transferable skills. Uh, you know, when it when it comes to uh, you know learning how to read a selling report, even as a designer, which the majority of you want to be or are planning to be, um, when you know how to read the selling report and um, talk about your business in a thoughtful, educated way, uh, you know it shows and it builds relationships across across the aisle with the different um, cross-functional teams that you may be working with, so that you know they understand that you are a true partner who who wants to move the business forward um you know when it comes from from the buying side to the selling side i always say the same thing it's really you all want the same thing you all want to sell more product to the customer at the end of the day it's just a, a matter of whether you're paying attention to the units that the customer is buying or the units that the uh, retailer is buying so um you know it kind of they, they go very hand in glove and i felt like the skills definitely transferred from the buying side to the selling side when i made the you know, sometimes you think of a career in fashion and you think you started as a designer or you started as the president. Some of the greatest designers in the fashion system started in sales. Yeah. Michael Kors and Calvin Klein and Ralph Lauren. Yeah. George Romani started after he was trying to be an architect. He worked in a, in a sales capacity for a textile company. So, you know, it's connecting the dots but at the end of the dots is trying to sell something to somebody yeah. and that's important. Yeah, definitely. And you know, something you said, I, I, I wanted to come back to Andy about how when you walk into an interview, um, you know, keeping in mind that the person on the other side of the table wants to hire you as badly as you want to be hired. I mean, you have to, it's, it's hard to put yourselves in the shoes of an interviewer um, when you're, when you're just starting out, but they don't want to keep interviewing and interviewing and interviewing. They want you to be the fit. So you're, you're already coming into the interview from a place of yes. Um, you just need to win them over and, and prove to them that you're the best person for the job. Um, but, you know, coming in with the, the feeling that this is an amiable relationship and, you know, it's, you're going to get along well is probably a, a much more comfortable way to walk into that interview than totally blindside, you know, totally nervous. We agree. And it's the time that you can sell yourself, sell yourself. It's, you're, it's okay to speak up your experience or how great you are. Don't be afraid to do that. That's what they want to hear. So again, they buy into you and you be a part of their team. I um, Unless you have a lot more that you wanted to ask, Andy, I feel like maybe um, some questions from the students who want to take some We're good. <laughs> Great. Um, does anyone want to raise their hand? Oh. Hi. So, like previously mentioned before, when you're talking about uh, interview and doing research on the company and then asking questions, would you say that asking questions back would be the best way to set yourself apart as far as being interviewed and uh, other interviewees? Because I remember I did an interview with, um, I think it was like uh, Bloomingdale's for like uh, a sales position. And I was like really caught off guard by how quick it was and how like I'd say general the questions the questions were. I think it was like ten minutes in total, you know. And like I don't know if that's like something that's specific to Bloomingdale's or sales positions or really in a lot of like department stores. But um, yeah, I know I was kind of caught off guard by it and also wondering like. 
how to maybe like anticipate something like that or um, prepare for it? Uh, I could jump in there. So uh, not a an uncommon experience. So I wouldn't take it as that, but also uh, depending on the role and depending on who you're speaking to, they may just have a list of 10 questions that their boss told them that they had to get answered. And so maybe they're just going to rip through that um, because they have a lot of other things going on. So uh, to be prepared for that, you know, again, think about the, what those questions could be beforehand and make sure that you have a, a thoughtful answer that you can provide back to them. Um, and then, yes, asking questions is a way um, it could separate you from the pack, but also it could, uh, um, you know, if you don't have any questions, it could put you at the bottom of the, of the stack too. So, um, you know, a few questions I'd like to have is, uh, you know, what are they, what do they think would be the most important skill sets for someone to be successful in this role? Um, and again, by saying that, they'll start listing them and you can relay back to some of your experiences, whether it's in school, another job, growing up, whatever it might be, you try to highlight, again, what they're looking for is in your background. So you're, you're again, checking off that box for them. Um, what do they see as the, the biggest challenge in the role? And then you can go back with some that you've done in your past to overcome that. Um, where do they see this person growing to, or where do they hope for this person to accomplish in the first six months, a year? Um, again, understanding what the expectations are going to be and, and, and how you can position yourself as, as being able to accomplish those goals. Um, you know, those are some things that I think are important to get across. And then one question that's important to ask before you walk out of an interview is, you know, have, have, after having spoken to me, is there anything that you feel we didn't cover? Or is there anything about my background that you want to know more about or you think would prohibit me from being successful? Try to deal with any of their um, uh, questions, uh, follow-up questions before you leave the door. So uh, you don't have any stone to turn before you walk out. Is that kind of what you're going for? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's great cool. advice. And I think, you know, I, I've never been a recruiter like David from that perspective. But at the same time, I think if you're having, if, if I get asked a question by someone I'm interviewing and they don't then interact, they don't like ping pong back with me after they've asked me the question, it's kind of a, a negative, I would say. You kind of, you, there, I assume that you're asking me that question because you want to get feedback that you can kind of jump in from. So, um, it's totally normal to David's point to hop back in with, oh yeah, that's great to hear because I did X, Y, Z and you know, you can, you'll notice on my resume, blah, 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 and you know, kind of highlight yourself again. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. What other questions are out there? Well, I have another one. Oh, great. Go. So this one uh, pertains uh, to, I'd say, more independent brands. And I would say with the, the whole COVID situation and independent brands mostly like taking the, the biggest hit compared to a lot of like, larger brands or conglomerates because mostly they have uh, uh, the financial means to be able to anticipate and be able to adapt to it. Do you think that it's going to take a couple of years before, I'd say, like being able to start uh, like an like independent brand? Um, I'm trying to think of how to like word this. Would it become more accessible like it did, like it was before pre COVID compared to now with how a lot of uh, supply chains are becoming limited due to? Uh, like this, let, let, me, let, me, let me try to tackle that in a couple of ways. Um, it's never easy to begin a brand, whether it be an indie brand or even a brand that people you think you know about. So one of the things to always be concerned about is having enough capital or credit available to start the brand um, and have the technology or the know-how of knowing how to source. Now I'm going to divide the answer a little bit and sort of beg the answer. Because of e-commerce, because of the internet, because of social media, and because of people working and look, living and talking in communities, this is a great time to start a new brand. But I wouldn't start the brand with the expectation of making money out of the box. It might be doing something you do on the side when you have another job, or if you have the resources to be able to survive, pay rent, eat, and do whatever you need socially. But 
people are communicating new brand ideas all the time. Uh, we worked with Supreme when it first started. I didn't understand how it got to be where it is. It was almost as if the community made it happen. Um, for the last eight years, we've been working with a well-known actress who owns a brand called Honest. Her name is Jessica Alba. And she had an idea. It was because she had a brand new baby and she wanted the ability to have a specific kind of product available and she couldn't find it. So she had the temerity to call some people up in the healthcare industry about diapers and some other products and she sold them the story. And she was convincing. And what they did, instead of selling the product, they gave it away. She found a community of, of moms who were the best community to speak to because they talk about food and pampers and the health of the babies. And she found five communities of women around the country and she made them all her resellers. And within 18 months, she developed a brand. That's a different way of approaching it, but it was done in, a, in an odd time and it was indie. And it still is indie, even though it's going public soon. But if you find a group of people that talk to each other, that like each other, that can give in to other people, you'll build a brand. Think of Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Nobody would have lived there 15 years ago until somebody said it's a good place to go for a drink and a burger and to shop. And it's not near a subway, but it's a mm -hmm. cool place to be. They found a community. It became a brand. Williamsburg is a brand. It's not a place. So, you know, it's a good time to be indie. But you have to remember, you need capital and credit and tools. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when you say that um, building independent brand or starting a brand has become like, it's become more democratized, like through social media and being able to like, kind of market yourself, like say uh, Peter Doe, which I don't know if this currently is still the case, but I think I was reading at one point he spends like no money on marketing. Like it's just purely uh, online store that's mostly promoted uh, through his Instagram page. But yeah, he's still like accumulated like a huge uh, demographic of customers and followers. Do you think that's a trend that's going to keep growing? Is more uh, independent brands pop up? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And especially being that older brands are less relevant to younger people. You know, my firm has represented Calvin Klein and Ralph Lauren and many brands like that. They stay relevant to the people that know them. But younger people are looking for new brand affiliations. They're looking for the next cool idea. They're looking for the next thing that's sustainable. You know, and all those buzzwords are the words that are, can make brands important. But you have to know how to use them. It's a language right. that you're going to create because sitting at FIT with your other students and with Caroline and your other instructors and professors, you've heard buzzwords. You got to borrow the buzzwords and put them in a, in a language of your own. And that's why Indie works. Mm -hmm. But you have Thank to you courage. so much. You need mm -hmm. courage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but Andy, what I would, I would also add that COVID changed the whole dispersal of products, right? So you had all these these brands that were sub they had to go to retail, okay, and they were at the mercy of a retailer. Now, because of COVID, they leapfrogged over the the, the, uh, the brick and mortar, the retailers, right? They went direct to the consumers, and it created a whole industry of people, of 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 I call them almost scientists that figured how to what a consumers. What drives that purchase, right? And there's a whole community of people that trade with Amazon and know the, the dynamics of Amazon and how to get, you know, the approval and 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 the and, and the ratings and what have you, and 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 fill a void. It, it's the most amazing um, phenomena that you see. So yeah, I see a potential. However, you want to make sure that if you're going to develop a brand and build a brand, it's got to be sustainable in the, in, in the economic sense, right? Because most startups, most startups 
to fail most, right? You want to be the one that you don't fail and you have the ability and a business plan and the financial backing and then, and the, and then, you know, cause I'm, I lend money to a lot of these brands and the, and the most, the largest reasons why they fail is because they don't, it's not because they don't have a demand. It's because they don't, they don't have a great product. They run out of gas, they run out of money. And that's the reason why they fail. So you, you want to make sure you have enough to, to sustain yourself. And that's, that's the most important in our view. You know, there, there are a couple of websites to look at about indie brands. There's one called Wolf and Badger, which will list a whole bunch of companies that I've got to tell you, some have been my clients I've never heard of before. But people have given birth, birth to the next idea. And again, as Michael said, you need the back end protection and know how to make it work. But because of direct to consumer e commerce, because of bloggers, because of social media, you know, if you haven't the next good idea, it's a lot easier than trying to sell Macy's or sell Bloomingdale's or sell a major retailer or product when they don't know who you are. You know, it, it's a, a dichotomy. People want to be able to build a product and sell it to the major stores. You know, there's good news and bad news in doing that. But if you can launch a brand quietly and get the undercurrent and get sort of the momentum started that way, I, I think that's a cool way to start a brand in today's world. Karen sees, Karen sees a lot of new brands all the time in, in her world. Yeah, I mean, we probably work with, I, I'd say at least 10 new brands, eight to 10 new brands every month. Um, and some of them are really well thought out and planned and some are a little less so. And we try to coach um, coach them, uh, you know, to get them on a track for success. Um, there's a lot of mentoring opportunities out there. There still is, um, you know, there, there are great networks, including the fashion service network that, you know, is, is willing to step up and lend time if they see great talent and a good idea. So you should definitely look out for them. We work with the CFDA on one of our mentoring programs. We have a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring program. Um, you know, the CFDA has a number of them that that aren't um, that that aren't associated with us that are are wonderful. So, you know, look for look for help. Look for guidance. Thanks. Thanks for your questions, Jack. Right. Thank you. Um, the next hand I see up is Azad. Hi. Uh, Hi. Thank you for very interesting information. So my question is, um, I'll start from uh, my, I have my brand like um, maybe two, three years already. So, uh, but it, it's, it just started, it's a new brand and I, I need to work for keeping my brand, like uh, on developing my brand. So that's why I'm looking for uh, fashion companies to go to work there. Uh, and the, the two of them hired me, uh, but there was also some point in the contract paperwork that I can do design any anywhere else beside of a company like I have to do only for them design so that's why I uh, I did I was not agree with that and I just not take that job so uh, is that really a very serious point in the companies saying giving us or I just can say nothing can do my develop my design in my brand and do their design also, and uh, this is one question. And the second question, I'm art person, I'm not in a business. So what you will suggest me, I, I'm starting my business with uh, neckties. I'm doing uh, hand sewing neckties and I'm doing uh, dresses, hand painting on it. 
So what do you suggest me? Uh, should I go to a company to work with them so they can develop my business and I do an art part or I just want to listen to your opinions, please. Thank you. Can I answer part of it? Then? Thank you. Uh, I, I, I have a question. I'm assuming you're very talented and you've been trained and understand textiles, but why would you pick the necktie business as one of the products when the trend on neckties is downtrending dramatically with men wearing neckwear less and less. So that's one question. The, the second mm -hmm. is I'm looking at sketches that are behind you. They look like they're evening products. Uh, yeah, special occasion more, mostly, yeah. So, so again, for the moment, for the moment, this might change Monday morning, special occasion businesses are under pressure because mm -hmm. people have not gone out. And until the rebound from COVID occurs, it, it's maybe one of the dark, quarter, dark corners of the fashion business. Mm -hmm. So the question is also about choices. No one's gonna question your talent or your intellect, but sometimes the choice yeah. of what to make and product needs to be thought about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just what you're saying. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. if you notice, I'm, none of the men, none of the men on the call today are wearing neckwear. Mm -hmm. It's just timing, though, because there is going to be some pent up demand in a year. Maybe people will be like chomping a bit for that stuff. <laughs> Even here, special occasion is going to be coming back in a big, big way. A lot of uh, a lot of our clients are starting to, to, to prepare for that. So as Andy said, it's not it's not right now, but as soon as the door is open, events are going to be, a, a, there's a lot of pent up demand uh, to go to events. So that could be a good place. Neckwear, I'm not so sure, although I'd still enjoy it. Um, but yeah. It's Sorry, I'm gonna throw my dog out. Um, <laughs> that's Lisa, I see you next. Uh, hello, um, so I have a question uh, pretty similar to the one that Jack asked, but a little bit more specific. There is one thing that I'm really curious for a long time and I'm asking people from industry around. Um, there are a lot of, um, luxury brands nowadays exist uh, in the fashion industry and some of them are uh, growing and uh, some of them as I know went out of um, of market a few um, like 10 years ago 20 years ago and I know there is uh, and I know that uh, many of them are owned by uh, LVMH um, so my question is um, is there really a possibility of uh, um, creating or uh, of um, for one of the brands, for one of the fashion houses to become as global as other ones now uh, in fashion industry, such uh, Gucci, Chanel, uh, Louis Vuitton. Um, and how much time does it really take to become one of the biggest global fashion houses in the world? So is there a possibility at all that one would um, kind of grow and um, how long does it usually take? That's a lot of questions, but I can answer part of it by good marketing, good promotion, great design connected to old brands works. Um, I, I had during my career in the fashion industry the benefit of working with Ralph Lauren and Calvin Klein but most importantly, I was the president of a business that owned Carl Lagerfeld's business. And Carl was never his own designer. Carl designed for Ferragamo. He designed for Fendi. He designed for Chloe. And then while he was working at my company, uh, Alan Wertheimer, who runs Chanel, said, we need somebody to come in and resurrect our brand because Chanel was dusty. 
Now, he was the perfect man at the perfect moment, but we've seen this over and over again. We've seen Stella McCartney when she was a Chloe. We see the resurrection of Dior. The question is, you know, it's the new talent behind an old brand and the owner of the brand wanting to make an investment in marketing. And it works, you know, it, it, it works, but you have to be at the right moment and the right time to get it done. And obviously, as we see the old guard of designers either retiring or passing away, younger talents have stepped in. We've seen Al Buzz, we've seen Stella McCartney, we've seen oodles of, of designers show up in somebody else's shoes. Balenciaga was dead for years before the brand came back. So the question is, how do you get into those companies and how do you get the opportunity? And that's a big question. It's hard. So you had two questions. I was going to say, Andy, one, of the, one example could be Off-White and Virgil Abloh and, and what he's been able to do in a very short amount of time and talk about being in the right place at the right time. I think he was and he was the right guy for it. And now he's designing for Louis Vuitton. So I think, is it possible? Yes. Um, but a lot of the stars have to align. And I think the customer uh, and the marketing, all that has to go and uh, has to be right for it to, to happen. And, and a lot of the other. Yeah, I, we, we see a lot of people. Yeah, that's what I thought when I was. Good. Uh, that's what I thought when I was thinking about um, fashion houses that grow really fast and off-white, uh, one of the examples. Uh, but, but the other question, can uh, one of the fashion houses, new fashion houses, really become as global as um, the biggest ones, as uh, Louis Vuitton and Chanel? Is that even possible to take over, please, or it's nearly impossible? Yeah, I was sort of getting there. Um, we see a lot of luxury brands launch, particularly in the handbag space, um, footwear space. It's very difficult to launch in certain categories, and it takes a tremendous amount of time and perseverance um, because those big brands, those established brands, even though sometimes one's hot and one's not, or, you know, one's cool and, you know, one goes a little dusty for a while, they tend to cycle around. Um, and to get a new brand into that cycle, um, with with a few exceptions, it is, uh, you have to have a lot of fortitude uh, and patience and um, money. And luck. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> luck. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask, uh, and it is connected to this question as well. So I know uh, to be able to uh, to stay uh, on the market as a um, high-end uh, fashion house, you really need to invest a lot of uh, finances into a copywriting. So the first, uh, the biggest problem that uh, fashion brands are facing is to make sure their products are not um, copied by other brands or uh, by China. Uh, and uh, I was curious, uh, how um, how big are how um, large are financial um, expenses for the copywriting um, defense? So, uh, um, a big part of my practice is licensing. We represent many well-known, famous designers, and not so famous designers. Um, there's a difference between a copyright and a patent. There's a difference between a license and a grant. Um, similar overlaps, but all different. Um, in protecting a design, there's something called, you can look this up online, called trade dress law. You can, you can protect a print or a pattern and register it. It's very difficult to 
register a design for a pair of pants or a jacket unless it has three legs and it's none. There's a use patent and a design patent or a design license. But every company that has a trademark, every designer that has a brand that wants to extend that brand enters into agreements called licensing agreements. Now, those agreements give the right to someone else to use their trademark. But if they did not register their trademark in a certain country, they're subject to somebody stealing the intellectual property, the trademark. So I'm sure over the years you've heard about or read that people in certain countries like China or even the Soviet Union have taken somebody's trademark that did not register it. And when you register that trademark, as the owner, you have to register it in different categories. There's categories for accessories and jewelry and apparel and footwear. So you must do a complete trademark registration. Right now, there's something called NFTs, non-fungible currencies, where you can look at this and you see an image of a cat was just recorded as an NFT. So this is a, a business, it's an art and a science. Protecting a trademark is the brand owner and the trademark's owner responsibility. And also it's a logistic and legal nightmare to get it back if somebody has registered it. So I'm sure it didn't answer all your questions, but there's a complete body of law and business that deals with this. My question also was, uh, how large is financial um, uh, part, uh, so like, uh, what is the percentage of the uh, revenue of the company that they spend on the, uh, on the protection of their designs on the copywriting and on licensing? I, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's an economic number to that, depends on the company itself depends on what they're protecting. Companies like Ralph Lauren and Vera Wang spend lots and lots of money protecting their trademarks all the time. Companies that are smaller designers can't afford to protect it because legal fees are high. So I, I don't think there's a number that's in, in use all the time, but it's very important at any cost to do as much as possible to protect the trademark, at least in the in the marketplace you do business in. All right, thank you so much for your answers. Okay. Um, Abby Grace, I see you have your hand up. Uh, I, panelists, I ho hopefully you're okay. We're running a little over, but um, let me know if anyone needs to hop off. <laughs> Hi, thank you guys so much for coming in and talking to us. Um, I just wanted to ask, how long would you recommend working in the industry before starting your own brand? And then how could you give some tips on establishing like good company culture that people would want like want to come and work for you? How to make your business seem desirable, I guess. Karen, you want to talk about company culture and David? Sure, culture is, is definitely something that's very important. And, and the short answer uh, for you, uh, Abby Grace, is where, where would you like to work and what would you like your company culture to be? And if you have a good answer for that and you put that into place, people will follow. And that's generally how it goes. I think uh, right now, if you, sort of, if, if you want a very structured environment, you'll, you'll find people who are going to want to be in a structured environment. If you're more comfortable in a flexible environment, that's who you're going to attract. So what sort of business do you want to be and who do you want to attract and create a culture that will match that? Um, the big uh, talking points these days are, are you know, flexible working schedule, work from home schedule. That's something. And, and I think the more progressive companies are more um, open to different uh, schedules and things like that. More traditional companies and structured companies are looking at people back in the office full time. Um, I think if you're looking for a, a, a 
there's there's gonna be an ethos to your company. What's your company about? What's your what do you want your people to be passionate about? And do you provide an outlet for that? So some companies like to have a lot of, of social engagements with them, and they're doing that virtually now too. Um, you know, some companies are, are more you know, structured. We're going to do this at this time. We're do that at that time. Um, so yeah, I think you know as far as building a culture, try to make it be representative of where you want to work like and you know, attract people with what they're like minded. As far as working in the, how long to work in the industry before building your own uh, brand, I think that can be so much subjective, but you know, Andy and Karen and, and Mike might have a better, better idea than that. Thank you so much. Well, you know, one of our interns uh, was building her own brand while she was in college, and she's now one of our great designers. So I don't think there's a right answer for that question. Starting your company or your brand, um, you know, can really happen at any time. And, you know, the culture piece, um, I think it's more important than it ever was before, feeling um, very comfortable where you're working at. Um, it's a little weird at the moment because it's hard to it's harder to share culture on Zoom, right? You know, it's hard, but still companies are doing it. You know, we do a call every morning. We try to celebrate along the way. It's not quite the same, but we still try to keep our team um, connected as much as we possibly can. And we're starting to go back to the office and all meet there at the same time. And, um, but you know, you'll find the, the environment that, that works for you. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, Hawa, did you have a question? Hi, yes, I do have a question. Um, so, hi, nice to meet you, and thanks for coming to my class. Um, my first question is, so after you become an indie designer and you feel comfortable with your amount of, like, clientele or your orders on your own website, um, how, do, how does a designer or brand, like, approach other like buyers, like since they're based in Canada and um, Dover Street Market, how would I reach out to them when I feel comfortable with my number of sales? Karen, you want to talk about trade shows and how important they are when they're working in accessories and apparel? Yeah, I, you know, trade shows are, are going to start up again. Um, some of them have already taken place and we've seen traffic at them, uh, you know, so for a new brand, um, the most important advice that we give is that you need to be part of the process. Um, you can't just pass it to a showroom or pass it to a rep. They want to know you. They want to develop a relationship with you and understand what your inspiration was and your creative process and why is this special and then uh, you know you can move it on to other places but certainly trade shows um, we're seeing digital environments work for brands that are already established so if they know you they know your quality they know what it feels like you know we're touchy-feely people um, you know digital works we're having a lot of success right now for um, introductions with Zoom calls, you know, just setting up a few minutes, let me show you my product. And a number of our companies are sending samples. Um, if it's real expensive product, they're taking a credit card, uh, you know, like if it's fine jewelry or something, but they're sending the samples so the stores can indeed touch it and feel it. We have uh, brands who are taking road trips that are going to meet with the stores and they're having great success because those stores are just dying to see and meet. And again, it's about touching and, and feeling the product. So if you have the opportunity to actually meet with someone, um, you know, that's, that, you know, that can be terrific too. You, using your LinkedIn, using your contact list to the best that you can um, to reach out to people. I don't know all the retailers. Sometimes if I want to get in touch with someone, I send them a note um, and personalize it. Don't No cut and paste. The, they want to know that you thought about why would my product be good for your store, not just here's pictures of what I do, take a look, because they're inundated with those kinds of emails. 
It's more like figure out who the owner is and, you know, dear store, I want to be in your store because, and this is why I think it's a good fit. And these are the brands that you carry and I would merchandise beautifully around them and you have nothing like what I have. Um, give them a reason. You know, in anything you're going to do in fashion, it's about a great product. Whether you're going to do a great product for Target stores or a great product for Bergdorf Goodman, you need a great story. The stories are important because people buy stories, you know, about what you're trying to tell them. But then you need the use of storytellers. The storytellers are social media, whether it be bloggers or anyone else can help you get your brand in front of people. But also to know the target who you want to sell to. And if you're doing all those things and, and listen to what Karen said, you'll be looked at by other people. And if the product makes sense to somebody, somebody will tell you it makes sense and you'll migrate to the next location to sell it. But also figure out who you want to sell it to. You know, there are stores that you would lose your product in and some stores your product would be immediately a hit. So you have to be cognizant of who you want to sell it to as well. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Marsha, you're our, our last question of the day. Sorry, I clicked out the window. Um, hi, yeah, I kind of have um, like, like three mini questions, but I think you may have just answered one of them. I was going to ask um what exactly would be considered what would make a brand unique like if you were to be an indie label uh what in what way you think you can set your brand apart from all the other thousands of other brands out there especially if you're looking for say like a backer because you mentioned earlier about how you'll need capital so if you were looking for someone to back you or to go into business with as a partner what would make you a potential candidate for them to back you. And my second um, part of my question was about um, when you have a job, when, <clears throat> sorry, when do you think would be the best time to, I'm sorry, what, what is the best way do you think you can get promoted at a job? And when would be the best time to ask for a raise um, if you've been there for a while? I, I don't know if that's too much questions. <laughs> Can I answer, I'll answer the first question. So I think the most important thing, if you have a if you have a, a brand, you have to know really very specific who that who your customer is. Is your customer a 28 year old um, individual living in Topeka, making X amount of dollars? You have to know where it where it belongs. Once you understand exactly who your audience is. That's where you have to focus because I think a lot of companies, we see more companies making mistakes, right? So they take, they take their brand and they enlarge it to offering all these other product categories. They lose sight of really what the core essence of that brand is and they get themselves distracted. So I think it's very important to really know who you're going to sell your items to. The most important. Um, and then from that, you know, all the other things, you know, the back, you know, if you have traction, if, if you have excitement in the brand, then of course, listen, there's a lot of money in the system. It'll come to you, right? They'll find you and they'll say, listen, we want to back you, we want to finance you, all good, you know, and, and we'll, we'll help you and you'll get help. As far as getting a, a, a raise or a promotion, I think it's always good to be mindful, not to jump the gun too early, and say, listen, I think I'm, I've been with a company a year. I think I've, I've learned a lot. I'm, I'm adding value. I think when we look at our employees, we want to know what employees are adding value, adding revenue, adding assistance. And those people, you know, get rewarded. And we don't want to lose people because it costs money to hire people. It costs money to terminate them. It costs money to train them. So we want to keep those people and we want them and we want you, if you're an employee, we want you to be happy. 
and be content and hardworking because sometimes, you know, there's going to be periods of our, you know, work week or work month that we're really going to need you to do, you know, go beyond, you know, the beyond to help with a, a particular project. So I think, you know, others may have another opinion, but that's how we view it. As far as getting a raise, David, you want to talk about if you think they're compensated? Yeah, I was just going to say, if, if you want to raise, if you want a promotion, do more than what you're asked to do. Start being better and being hungrier and being faster than everyone else in the room. And if you can do that, you're going to get noticed. And it, just as Mike was saying, you're providing value. You're doing more than what you're asked of. You're going to be compensated for more than that. Now, if you're doing that, you're being hungry and it's going two years and you haven't been tapped on the shoulder, then it's time It's time to ask for it. If you feel like you have provided more value than what you originally hired for or what your role is and it's going on uh, an extended amount of time without being provided or being put up for a promotion or raise, then that's, it's perfectly fine to ask for one. And, and the right forum is first – um, ask your boss to have uh, whoever your manager is. So, you know, ask them to have a, have a conversation. If you have you know quarterly business uh, reviews, or if you have you know meetings and reviews, um, you know monthly, weekly. That those that's the time to ask for it or, or ask for their advice. You know, I feel like I've been going above and beyond. What do you think is the next step for me? Is there a next step for me here? I'll, you know, put the thought out there into their head that you're thinking about that, and maybe they'll come to you with it. If they don't, then you flat out ask, okay, what do I have to do to get to that next level? What do I have to do to get a raise? And then you're not saying, I want a raise, but you're, you're asking what you have to do. And then if you do it and you still don't get offered, they say, you know, we spoke three months ago and you said, if I did this, I'd be off an opportunity. Do you think I performed well? Yes. Well, okay. So, and then, then they'll know what the, the answer is. If they keep pushing you off, then it's time to say, okay, I've done as much as I could for this company. I'm not being rewarded or being acknowledged the way I think I should be. And that's the time to start going out into the market. And, and if you feel you can do more than what your company is, is envisioning for you, um, you know, put that, uh, put that into the, uh, into the market and, and see what other opportunities are out there. Um, you usually end up getting a bigger raise when you change companies than when you do it internally. Um, but also people don't like to see on a resume, a lot of moves. And if you start becoming jumpy, um, companies won't see you as, as attractive. So there's going to be a balance there too. That's great. I think that's great advice. Well, thank you all for being thank here. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Marsha. Um, thank you all for being here and, um, you know, dealing with uh, the technical difficulties and all that. Uh, it's always such a welcome pleasure to have all of you from FSN on and hear um, your expertise. So thank you. Thank you. Um, stay thank you all. <laughs> and see you soon. Thank you, guys. Best of luck. Thanks. Best of luck, everybody. Thank Be you. Well, everybody. Thank you. It's my turn to wish you best of luck as well. Um, good luck this week on the final. Sorry about my annoying dog. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at any time. I'm here. I'm here for you guys. So. Have a good one. You've been a pleasure. Thank you.